Welcome to episode 21 of Renewing the Conversation, a series of interviews where we talk to leading industry professionals and experts about renewable energy and heating, with a focus on the home and what challenges face the industry and homeowners. Today, welcome Thomas Novak, Secretary General of the European Heat Pump Association. We speak to Thomas about air source heat pump adoption in Europe and how the UK compares. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button below and please try to support by giving us a thumbs up. Enjoy the interview. Good morning, Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us today from the European Heat Association. Uh, this is going to be an interesting interview, actually, because I think what we have been quite insular with regards to heat pumps in the last year to two years, when heat pumps have become a really hot topic in the UK, we've really kind of just spent most of the time talking about heat pumps in the UK, how we're going to transition, what it means for us. So I'm really keen to learn a little bit more about what's going on with heat pumps in the rest of Europe. Europe. Can you tell us uh, which other countries are more advanced in heat pumps and which countries where residential homeowners have adopted heat pumps more broadly? Thank you very much and, and good morning Kirsten and good morning Mars. Very happy to be here. It's a true pleasure because I have watched your show quite a few times and it, it, I was always thought I want to be there too. Here we are. Um, indeed, I, I have encountered that the heat pumps are the, the, the top of the news in the UK. I've heard Boris Johnson say that uh, for the UK, it's, it's heat pumps now for heating. And it's a smart decision. Uh, other countries have come to that conclusion uh, quite a decade or two earlier. Notably, Sweden has a very strong heat pump market. Norway has a very strong heat pump market. Finland has been following very fast. Denmark has recently reduced the cost for electricity, which has an impact on the sales numbers of heat pumps. Switzerland, Austria uh, have been very established heat pump markets where also now uh, heat pumps are used in renovation. So it's no longer only heat pumps in new builds, but also renovation. And other countries are following, uh, following up fast. Notably, Germany has seen probably the fastest switch in the last year and this year because they have introduced a CO2 price and they, they have an cut the CO2, the electricity costs slightly, they will discontinue the levy that is uh, applied to electricity from the energy transition in electricity. And that will actually give an additional impact. And then there is also a very strong subsidy scheme. So what you can see is on the one hand, we have countries that have a long standing history. These are notably those where there is no gas grid, which is a really important influencing factor uh, in Scandinavia. And then there are, there are others that are changing now and they are changing fast if they put a proper support scheme in place and have the pricing effect of uh, relative prices, electricity versus gas under consideration. That's really interesting that you say that um, they're putting the countries that are changing the, the fastest are really having to put the right support in behind that. Is the UK in that category for you? Do you think that the UK government has done everything it can and is offering the maximum support to homeowners to adopt and encourage that adoption faster in the UK to heat pumps? I think the efforts have been really good. I'm not sure if the impact is of the same order of magnitude. What, what I thought when the first RHI initiative was, uh, and was launched a couple of years back, I thought this is the best available support scheme you could ever imagine. But unfortunately, we could not see that there is a huge impact in the market. There is a lot to learn, but what you learn there is that they say the system is too complicated. So, so in principle, the first time you read what the government has in mind, it sounds great. And then you look at the details and it's so complex that people often do not want to go down that route. And that's maybe something I would also mirror from other countries in, in Europe, if the, the concept of a support scheme is too complicated, it's actually distorting markets. It's not helping them because you will have a slow start. Then when everybody is on board, you will have a big run on the scheme and then it's typically running out of funds and then the government stops it. And then everybody says, okay, so this is really not something I should be doing. So then there is a stop in the market. Installers have problems in finding clients and then it starts again. This, this start-stop mechanism is not very helpful. I do not know if the currently proposed bonus of these £5,000 is enough. And, and I find it quite challenging to say we can do um, a boiler versus heat pump replacement for £5,000. I know that some market players are suggesting they can, and probably they can if you are looking at the low-hanging fruit first, but I don't think that's the price level for all installations. So I, I would have a 
a split impression on what the UK government is doing there. I think the overall communication is very good, but in the details, it has to be sharpened and precise to make it easy and to make it appropriate for the whole building stock. Yeah, you mentioned that the government is coming in with the £5,000 grant for heat pumps and £6,000 for ground source. Um, in the UK. You're right, that is just not going to cut the entire, that's not really going to be a major mm -hmm. contribution to a homeowner um, when we're looking at the majority of kind of um, heat pump installations in this country kind of being around the 12, 15,000 pound mark for a heat pump um, and then up to 20,000 for ground source. So compared to other European countries, um, our installation prices seem to be quite a lot higher. Is that correct? And is that purely down to the fact that the, um, the industry here is, is so um, immature, so it's in its infancy? And um, once we get more installers and more people are adopting heat pumps, will that price kind of lower? Is that what you've seen in other countries mm. in Europe happen? That is an interesting question that probably we need to look at <clears throat> for each country. The difference between the UK boiler prices, which are, to my knowledge, incredibly low, and I don't even know how a boiler installer can, can offer these prices and make a good living. I, I find them beyond imagination for nearly all other countries and the heat pump prices that are then comparatively high. And I think this is an important point that needs to be raised much more often. It is not that the heat pump itself is too expensive. It is that the alternative, the counterfactual, is far too cheap. And that is the immediate result of government policy. Governments have made fossil-based heating cheap for years, and that is true in many countries, and they have made electricity-based heating systems more expensive. Then we can also say that heat pumps came to the show a bit late. So where the gas boiler manufacturing plant is completely written off, and you really make money from the production uh, and, and probably quite a lot, the heat pumps still repay R&D costs and factory building costs. So there is, there is a different set of costs that are applied to the end user as we speak. But looking at, at your question then, so is, it, is, is the UK price too expensive? That I can't answer in detail because the, there is no average price for a heat pump. That's like saying, so what's the average price for a car in Europe? And you compare Fiat 500 and a Porsche Taycan and, and, and then you compare it in different markets. I do think, however, that in many markets, the heat pump is sold as a luxury product, by it, but that's a manufacturer choice, right? So this is the latest product that we have added to our product range. This is the most innovative one. You know, it uses renewables, it's clean, et cetera, PP. So if you want to be at the forefront of developments, you should buy a heat pump. But then we also want a bit of a, a bit better profit margin. What you see in Sweden, for example, where the heat pump is the complete normal product and you basically discuss more which brand to take or which type you take. You want an exhaust air heat pump or geothermal or is an air to water heat pump the right choice for you? There, this competition has driven down prices. And what I see on top of it is that we are at the end of quite a tremendous legislation, legislation stretch where governments have put... Uh, requirements on energy efficiency on sound on new refrigerants and also requirements on energy efficiency of components that all led to the need for redesign of products to the industry but this is this is over now i, I would say right by and large we are we have implemented all these pieces of legislation so the next round of new factories and the next round of uh, of manufacturing increase and sales increase will lead to uh, to reduction in production prices and hopefully also to the reduction of the the cost of the insulation process. Uh, you mentioned that the adoption rates in the UK was quite low, given that the government subsidies were actually quite attractive. A big portion of that actually stems from the fact that there is a misconception amongst that heat pumps don't work. Was this a similar kind of mindset in Europe? And how did governments overcome that? I'm not even sure that governments overcame that. I think it's, it's really that the market has overcome it. It was when I started my work in Brussels, uh, quite often I had to hear that heat pumps don't work. I have in fact made a, a graph of the, the rejection curve of heat pump arguments. You know, it started by saying heat pumps don't work at all. And then it's then when that was not no longer a feasible argument because in Switzerland and Sweden, they just had so many. And by the way, I mean, these are the coldest countries in Europe and heat pumps have the biggest market penetration. So if you want to argue that technically this, this product is not feasible to provide heating 
maybe you need to go back and do your homework. It's, it's really, I'm also a bit impatient by now. If somebody comes to me and wants to discuss whether heat pumps work or not, I say, okay, you know, read first, then we can discuss on a level that is appropriate because this is no longer a question. But that was the first thing. Then people said, yeah, okay, so it's geothermal heat pumps that work, but, uh, but not, not nothing else, not the air source ones and air to air, not at all. Of course, that was also disputed and then eventually overcome because of reality. And then they said, okay, the residential is fine, but only new builds. Now we, we know that you can do heat pumps in renovation. Then the question was, what about, uh, what about industrial heat pumps and district heating? And here, actually, the oldest examples of heat pumps, not very big market penetration, but the oldest examples of heat pumps are from the 1980s, 1990s, biggest heat pumps in Stockholm, uh, Helsinki, Gothenburg run uh, megawatt installations, run the district heating systems there. It's, it's established technology. So that went, got, went by. And now we're in a situation where people say, okay, either we cannot have these, these heat pumps because they will destroy the electric grid. So we will all live in blackout, uh, in blackouts for half the winter, or they are too expensive. And you can see that the people that push these arguments forward are normally not the ones that are actually installing the heat pumps. So there is a strong resistance from the fossil industry, they do not want this technology to succeed in the market. And it's getting increasingly more difficult for them, but the arguments are still not stopping. And there is quite concerted action sometimes to bring this forward again and again and again. And to tell people, you can't afford this technology. Um, it's too expensive. You should have cheap heating. What it strikes me really that if you think this to the end and let's apply it to the UK with this notoriously bad building stock, if you say I'm not renovating you, I'm not encouraging you to renovate your house, and I will not encourage you to use a more energy efficient technology. You should simply replace your existing boiler with a new boiler technology. What does it give to the people? It gives them the continuation of a leaky house, the, the drafty, maybe not very nice indoor air quality or in the indoor environmental quality, and the heating costs will be high as today or even higher because the new fuels that are coming can by definition not be as cheap as today's fossil gas. That's really interesting actually. I wanna pick up on that point because you mentioned there that um, uh, a lot of the other countries that have adopted or did adopt heat pumps in the early days kind of almost sounds like they were kind of adopting it first into new builds. Do you think that part of the, um, the resistance UK from homeowners and the the fear is that we're actually kind of doing it backwards our government hasn't told new builders and developers that they have to put in heat pumps we have really lagged on that side and instead the onus has been on homeowners who have got you know 100 200 year old homes to retrofit and we all know that there's no shying away from whenever you retrofit heat pumps it's going to be there's going to be a level of additional investment and a level of additional um, inconvenience, for example, with regards to anything when you retrofit, you've got to, you know, for example, adjust rooms, change things around, um, make whether it's minor adjustments or redecorate, etc. With home own, with new homes, it's very, very simple. It's part of the, the building process. It's into a new development and the, the people, the new homeowners move in. They never experience any inconvenience. Therefore, it's a lot more of a positive um uh, non-invasive experience having a heat pump so is that where we've kind of as the uk we've kind of done it backwards and because we've done it backwards we're kind of dealing with all of those kind of concerns and issues now much earlier on in the process yeah that that could be but you could ask yourself also why are the new built uh, the new built builders in the uk not opting for heat pumps immediately. Uh, I built one house myself, but I've been participating in, in four housing projects over the last six years with friends and family, and they all took heat pumps. And what you can conclude is if the install, if the architect knows what they are doing and have a bit of an understanding of building technology, which not all have, I guess, but at least we have encountered different ones. And those that understand how, how the technology and the building envelope play together, they choose a heat pump and a photovoltaic panel and make the building ready for an electric charger and foresee space for a battery. So it seems to be quite a logical conclusion that if you build a new house, you can adjust all these things. And if you don't, you're, if I may say, a bit lazy. Yeah, you're, you're not doing your homework according to state-of-the-art uh, knowledge and according to maybe standards. Because even 
in the EPBD, the European uh, Performance of Buildings Directive, which at least to my knowledge is, is the foundation also for the UK legislation, as, at least as we sp still speak, um, <laughs> there is the requirement for, for, near, for near zero emission houses for new buildings since 2020 and 21, and, and it's not executed properly. So you could ask first, are we really implementing what we know? And I know that there is a big hesitation against um, uh, forcing people to do things, but I think in new buildings, it's, it would not harm many people if they were forced to put a heat pump into the house or an alternative. I, you can also design passive house buildings that don't need much heat anyways, though, so that would be fine. But I think accepting that you still have a house that uses, I don't know, 70 watts or more per, per square meter for heating, that is not appropriate for the time in which we are. That would help because you would increase the volume and then the, the industry could build up. You would have more installers. You would have more architects that understand how that works. You would reduce the resistance. And I guess what is very interesting is you would also make it more knowledgeable, more known to, to friends and neighbors that heat pumps work. I'm just reading this book that's called uh, Under the Influence uh, about the impact of, of peer pressure, basically. And there they say, if you have a lot of photovoltaic deployment, is one employment, one example that the, the author gives. If you have a lot of photovoltaic deployment, it's normally not spread evenly. It's, it's in clusters. So if you live in a street where you, you're the first guy to build a heat pump and you talk to your neighbors and they, they ask you, so how are you satisfied are you? And you give a positive testimony, then I think this will spread. And that's what we see today. Last year, we had 2 million heat pumps in Europe and heat pumps are the talk of town. So the, the fact that heat pumps work with many people, at least, I mean, we have 16 to 17 million installed now in Europe. That means also that people will talk positively about the technology. And I think that will convince them to the question of existing buildings. Is, is, that, uh, is that the wrong start? I think you can also do that well, but it's not as easy. So the, the, the option to make a mistake and to be dissatisfied if you don't find the right installer and if you don't find the right guy that says, OK, but, you know, your cavity walls, we could just insulate them. It's not too expensive. The risk is higher. That admittedly, yes. It's really interesting, this conversation, because it kind of has highlighted to me that actually you know, we've we've spoken to many um, people within the industry in the last few months um, in other heat pump associations and um, and also uh, lobbyists as well for mm -hmm. heat pumps and they're they're all saying the same thing that the government really needs to start taking it more seriously um, the issues regarding uh, developers and housing developers coming in and building especially when at the moment we've got um, a really big uh, push in the UK for bringing in new housing stock and those goals are very high and we've got a lot of um, real big targets to meet there and I think that as you said it's it's just what well, it seems really irresponsible apparently carrots have been tried they have tried to um, ask the developers to do the right thing and they have tried to educate them to do the right thing but now I think that the attitudes are changing and it's like okay they're not coming to the party they're not doing the responsible thing for us long term um, and as you said it doesn't just have to be heat pumps it could be building passive homes, it could be adding in other renewable mm -hmm. energies into those um, housing developments. And I think that, yeah, maybe the consensus is that um, carrots don't work, so maybe a stick needs to be um, something needs to be put into legislation. I guess it's for the new build, it's not even costing more. So I, I wouldn't know why why anybody should be against it unless you have the the doubt that the, the building developers just want to make a bigger cut. <laughs> because otherwise you really, yeah, yeah I, I don't know that i mean this is not for me to comment but but i was i visited when i when i traveled to glasgow i visited also zero in cardiff uh james and and his colleagues and they they said clearly taking over ex pre like pre-developed uh, projects and then moving them from gas to heat pumps makes perfect sense and the end user is also buying so maybe it would be helpful to explain to these developers that the value of their product is actually increasing. And I don't know how the affordability of new builds is in the UK at the moment. It's probably difficult in all, in all uh, regions of Europe, but it, it will make it more attractive to buy such a building. And everybody that I know that has a heat pump is reporting positively. If you have a floor heating system, you can walk around barefoot. Now you can say, okay, but we can also stare, stand 
18 degrees and, and draft, fine. But you can also enjoy a very nice living environment uh, while you're at it and you have built a new house after all. So it, it should be good, right? And yeah. For, yeah. For, from a parent's perspective, I would also say you, you also show responsibility. So why, why can we not, you know, instead of forcing them, could we not put it out as a positive development to say you are a responsible building developer, you're, you're taking care of the future generation and that you don't do if there is a fumes coming out of out of an exhaust. Uh, so you mentioned the housing stock in the UK, it obviously is old, it's, it's quite drafty. And we now know that heat pumps work very successfully in places like Sweden and the rest of Scandinavia. Was there a push on behalf of those particular governments to get people to build houses that were more insulated straight off the bat? Because even now, I don't feel that all the housing stock that is being built in the UK still necessarily adheres to the highest levels, uh, purely because, you know, the developers do want to save a little bit of money. Does that happen in, in Scandinavia? To my knowledge, the Scandinavian end consumer insists on a proper insulation mm. because, because as a consequence of the winter climate. Yeah. And uh, my, my nephew is just spending a year in north of Sweden. He showed me pictures, minus 27 degrees. Uh, so, of course, you, you have this is a very self-centered perspective to say, if I buy a house, it has to be well insulated and I cannot accept uh, leaky windows or a leaky main door. What about the governments? What they have done in Sweden, for example, they have banned oil heating. There has never been a significant gas grid in Sweden. So that, that was not an issue. But then it was, they banned, um, they banned oil heating, I think in the 80s about, if I recall correctly. Then the opportunities to heat a house in Sweden were biomass, district heating with heat pumps often, sometimes also with cogen units, and of course, uh, direct electric heating. And if you come from that perspective, then switching from the direct electric heating, so, so the building envelope was not the problem. The direct electric heating used the electricity that it used. But if you put in a new heat pump over the year, you could save probably 60 to 70 percent of the energy from day one. So the attractiveness of heat pump technology for countries that have a huge share of direct electric heating has always been stronger than for those where you have a, a gas boiler, especially when you're in the UK and your replacement gas boiler goes for less than 2000 pounds and your heat pump costs you 12, 15, then of course it's a discussion. Do I wanna go on holidays with the remaining money or do I invest it in the heat pump? We are at the moment trying to do an energy transition where the end user is responsible to take this decision. And that is putting a burden on many people that I find is too heavy. Yeah, not everybody is, is uh, completely green and wants to do that and has time for that. Some people have normal lives and cannot or do not want to. I'm not there to judge that. Pay attention to the topic. But even for those, we have to take them on board. And hence, I think it's really important for governments. And we are trying to push in that direction to start to make the cleanest energy solutions also the cheapest. Because everybody, no matter where your orientation is, can check their money and they will they will make some calculations. And if the heat pump technology or anything that is similarly green and efficient is the cheapest solution, you will just buy that. So this winter, we've um, the UK has really had some tough things to deal with regards to um, electricity tariffs and our energy crisis here. There hasn't I haven't seen too many headlines and we're we kind of watch a lot of news um, across different channels too many headlines in the news about um, how if the energy crisis is stretched into Europe and if other homeowners in the UK are facing really um, scary electricity tariffs. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about that and, and if that has if that is the case and how that has also affected the heat pump market in the UK uh, in sorry in Europe? For sure the energy crisis the gas crisis has actually radiated out it, has, it hasn't originated in the UK so I should say that differently the gas crisis applies everywhere. We, we see that gas prices are increasing. We see that electricity is increasing. We see that, uh, member, that uh, clients of electricity providers of utilities that have offered very cheap tariffs uh, where the company went bankrupt are now in the highest price 
offering of the local electricity pro providers because the good thing about all of this is you will never be out of out of electricity the even if if your provider fails then there is an obligation in all europe that you that whoever else is delivering there has to take you on board of course they don't prescribe the price for that and that has led to a lot of disturbance in the market and many people be being very unhappy i personally do not really understand why we have to take the marginal cost of gas to uh, to decide on on the electricity price that's something that must be in the mechanics that i didn't pay enough attention to to learn how it really works but it it makes no sense because if you think that we have 40 percent of electricity today from renewable sources where the costs have not gone down and to the contrary then why is the the and gas is not the dominant and energy carrier for the rest of electricity production so why is this small piece of the cake influencing everything. There is probably somebody that can explain that much better to me, but I don't understand that it's necessary. So I would say, fine, I can understand the mechanics. I don't do now, but I don't think it should be like this. You mentioned that other countries, other um, governments in Europe have um, have actually subsidized or, or given a, a more attractive electrical uh, electricity tariff to heat pump owners. That hasn't yeah. happened here yeah. in the UK. And I have to say, um, something pretty controversial, but I'm going to say it, and that is, you know, we put in our heat pump, you know, three years ago, um, days, we were on a fantastic electricity tariff. Um, this year, our electricity tariff is the highest it's ever been. In fact, I think it's double um, the highest that we were and, before. And by April, it have trebled. So for us, it's financially very unsustainable to be running a heat pump. And I have to say, as a heat pump owner, when you've um, been at the forefront and you feel like you've done the right thing for the environment, you feel like you've done the right thing for your country, made a positive contribution by financially investing in a heat pump, you kind of feel a little bit penalized in the fact that, oh, okay, so I've done that. I've paid up that money. I've done the right thing. And now I'm still getting absolutely hammered with electricity tariffs. Do you think that the UK government needs to um, maybe consider what other governments have done in other European countries and how they've supported um, heat pump owners with their electricity? Mm -hmm. I feel what you're what you're saying, and I do agree. I think the governments should take into consideration that those people that take the decision in favor of a clean heating system, and, and in our case, yeah, I like it to be best if it's a heat pump, um, they should be honored for that and they should be they should be given an advantage. And at the moment, it's not like that. A colleague of mine once said that it's like you're in school and, and the best student in class, whenever they raise their fingers, they're always hit by the by the ruler on their hand. Like, yeah, shut up. You again? No. And and the, the guys in the back row that shout loud and say, we can't do, we can't change, they get a, they get a, some sweets. It's, it's really strange and it, it needs to change. But let's not be too optimistic on what other governments have done because the electricity prices are still high. And... Mm. We are discussing as we speak this morning in the European Parliament was the debate in the Environmental Committee uh, and the rapporteur Peter Liese presented and defended in fact his suggestion for an emission trading scheme that would include oil and gas as energy carriers for heating. And you find a lot of resistance against that, but this would in fact be a measure that would balance the operational cost of the energy system. So probably you wouldn't feel that bad for your high electricity prices if you knew that they are still lower than your neighbor's fossil energy prices. The problem that I see continuously and is repeating itself is that the fossil energy system is too cheap. And, and mm -hmm. if you would add a meaningful CO2 price on the cost of operating a fossil boiler, you would be above the cost of operating a heat pump system. Now, <clears throat> electricity is also taxed too heavy and there is too many Levi's on it. So that makes it double expensive. And I think it, governments would be better advised if they would take these burdens off the electricity price instead of trying short-term measures. The Belgian government has just introduced um, a new Viet T rate uh, on electricity, and it lasts for half a year. So what, what does that do? It's, it's not a long-term perspective. I think mm -hmm. electricity is greening the cheapest. We will have 65 70% green electricity by 2030. That's at least what the predictions are, and, and can probably decarbonize somewhere before 2045 completely. Then we will have 100% green electricity 
why is this electricity the most expensive energy carrier? And I, I think every government, every energy, every, every minister of economics has to ask themselves that question because we want people to use electricity, we want to electrify buildings, light commercial buildings, uh, other buildings, uh, official buildings, and, and also industry. So we have to make this energy carrier cheaper. And the benefit of it is that we will stop investing so much money into importing fuel from outside Europe that will then leave us with the pollution. Because I mean, that's what we have to be clear about. If you burn one liter of diesel, by logical, by simple chemistry, the, the molecules will go somewhere just in a different form, right? So you will have created, I've seen once uh, in, in, at the COP15, they had this air balloon that showed one ton of CO2 emissions. It's quite a big balloon, but I mean, that's what you do. You, you transform the liquid into molecules that are then polluting the atmosphere. So I was pretty impressed to hear that you took on the challenge of driving in an electric vehicle from, I think, was it London to COP in uh, Glasgow? Um, first of all, tell us about you know what, what happened during that journey, who you met and why that was so interesting. And I've got to ask you about um, when that happened, uh, COP, uh, had a number of journalists here in the UK that also drove in their yeah. electric uh, cars. I think there was one guy from Sky oh, News yeah. who drove in his electric car and he documented the journey and was basically saying we need a lot more electrical uh, car chargers in the UK um, that, that needs to be addressed quickly. So also, did you actually get there in your electric <laughs> car and how was that experience? It was an entirely positive experience, I can really say. I, in fact, I started in... In Dusseldorf, where I live, I went via Brussels. I visited a few installations in Belgium and the Netherlands, always heat pump installations, then went via London, uh, via Bath and Cardiff, then via Preston, close to Manchester, and then to Glasgow. And when this COP came up, I thought, okay, does it really make sense to go there? Because it's a lot of debate, and what do I have to do there as an industry representative? And then I thought maybe we can use the press coverage that COP has to explain that actually, despite the need for making global progress in having this framework convention applied and in implemented, you also need to tell people what is possible. And hence this idea of saying, let's make it a heat pump tour to the COP. And then, of course, I thought, okay, if it's a heat pump tour, then I need a car that has a heat pump on board. And so I got an electric vehicle that uses the heat pump for battery management and uh, indoor uh, climate management of the, the passenger cabin. And then we started, we drove and it's all in all, it was, I think, back and forth, it was something like, yeah, 3,600 kilometers. Wow. And it, and it worked. You, you <laughs> find enough chargers. It's really, there are great small tools that tell you how to do it and uh, where you have to, you can you put your car, your, the make of your car and the battery in there and they tell you, okay, this day you have to charge in the middle of the day. So you plan accordingly. It's a change of plans a little bit, but it's not really difficult if you can plan in advance. And so that was really no, a non-issue. Charging was simply possible. One time we arrived at a charger where other people were already charging. So uh, we had to wait, yes, but this will also, uh, also change. It was a good coffee and donut break. <laughs> indeed, I mean, uh, yes, I had a lot of a lot of coffees and a lot of cookies. That's indeed true because many of these charging stations now have understood that people will stay there for half an hour. So there is a nice cafe next door and and good coffee and and or some some food. So yes, I think this will change the way you travel. But maybe it will only bring us back to the way we traveled, or not we, our ancestors traveled 120, 130 years ago. If you imagine that this uh, Geet Mishnah that everybody talks about was a book to attract people to travel more and, and to tell them, look, you know, at the end of that road that you would never go into, but there's a nice restaurant. So, you know, if you go there with your car, then you can have a good food. So other than the coffees and the, the cookies, uh, what else did you experience on your heat pump tour? You said that you actually visited a number of heat pump sites or heat projects. Which ones really stood out to you as being the most interesting? That I probably don't even want to judge. What stood out as most interesting was the people that I, that I met. I, I found it, and I'm still, like, you can ask everybody that I have been talking to about this tour, but what really struck me is that everybody I talked to was happy about what they were doing, even if it was not very easy sometimes, even if they had to overcome problems, but they felt that they were doing the right thing. 
And that is something I, I've uh, also, I, we, we are in the process of communicating that more to the policymakers in Brussels. I think we have to take people seriously in their wish to contribute to this energy transition. And it should be an honorable cause for the policymakers to create a market framework that makes it easy for them to participate. If you look at the, the recent proposal by the Irish government on how to renovate their building stock, that is a good example. They have set up subsidy schemes. They have set up an advice system so that you can also trust that you will make the right decision. On the tour itself, we went um, through Netherlands, Belgium, then the UK. In the Netherlands, we visited a, a couple that was renovating their an old farm into a bar, into a bed and breakfast. So they used three heat pumps even because they will they expect a lot of water needs. But anyways, they have photovoltaic on the roof. They have these heat pumps, and then they have a nicely insulated building, so that worked pretty well. In London, we were at the Islington Heights. Um, district heating system where they where they use a huge heat pump to provide heat to district heating and then we visited uh, Slough, the the training center of octopus where they address the need for mass um, education of installers most impressive maybe from the building is the cathedral in bath and i know you live rather close to it so wow so you should drive there and then you should know that the heating of this cathedral is as of now done by heat pumps and that is you know, a building that is now, I think it's about a thousand years old and you can renovate it and you can still heat it with the most modern technology. The building is impressive. The technology is also impressive. Then we were in Cardiff uh, where, the, where Zero is doing this multi-building projects and puts them on, on an electric footing with photovoltaic and a charger and heat pumps. So, you know, everybody that I talked to here, they, they were all ambitious in getting this further and forward and that was probably the biggest thing. In Preston, we visited this, uh, this housing project that also won the European Heat Pump Association uh, Heat Pump Award last year, where they renovated 145 apartments under occupancy with the people living there. And they put out the old boilers and put in uh, new heat pump systems. And that shows that even in a tower block where you would otherwise say, how, you know, how can you? You cannot renovate it properly. The windows are what they are. It doesn't work. So what they what they did is they put in a loop into the whole building behind the uh, elevator shaft, and then every layer, every level is taking the energy from that loop. So it's basically a shared geothermal installation, only that the geothermal loop arrives at each apartment. And that this ingenuity, if you think of it, is also a good sign to to show that if we spend some more. Um, some more effort in R&D and in finding solutions, we will have solutions for everything. Then we arrived eventually in, in Glasgow and there was uh, my friend Dave Pearson who has built the, the big heat pump in the uh, Queen's K district heating system. And then that was, uh, that was really impressive. I mean, if you ever have the chance, you walk in there and you see how the heat exchanger against the River Clyde uh, works and takes the energy that is just flowing by and that's what I have learned from him. Every time you see a river, don't see it as a river. It's a huge flow of energy. And that is that has changed my perception of the word actually quite a bit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's fascinating. I have to say, I don't know. Um, obviously, we're not professionals and we're not experts in the industry. But just from an outsider homeowner perspective and from someone who has been very involved in interviewing a lot of people in the heat pump industry, I kind of feel, I don't know if it's too strong a word, but I do feel like we're going through a bit of a revolution with regards to central heating there seems to be so much more innovation and as you said passion um, that's coming into the marketplace and lots of different ideas and kind of every time we speak to someone they mention some other project that I've never heard of that is just so groundbreaking in what it's doing do you feel that that um, that did you really feel that come across to you when you were doing those tours that just everybody was just so passionate and excited about the future because there is just seems to be so many more options other than just sticking a fossil fuel boiler into every single property? Yeah. It's yeah. Clear and simple, the answer is yeah. And, and you are also a good example for that. Uh, that. That people like you that are, you know, just normal folks, I would say, going uh, outside the, the city, buy a farm, it's like, so what do we do? What do we do to do better? And this question, I have found so many people they were driven by this passion. Maybe we could call it a renaissance, you know, this, this opening yeah. of the minds when it comes to energy. We, we move away from this 
the understanding that we, that we had since our ancestors lived in caves where, okay, you make a fire and then it's warm. And okay, now you burn something else and it's warm into a direction where we say, no, you can do this much smarter. And, and what fascinates me from the beginning about this heat pump technology is this opportunity to lift energy from one level to the other. And you can close energy cycles. If you think of a factory, for example, and you have, you bring in milk at four or five degrees, right? And then you heat it up for pasteurization to 72.4 degrees or five degrees. And then you cool it down again because you want to deliver it as yogurt and, uh, and as uh, a fresh milk. The energy that you need to run all this process is basically included in the milk in the beginning because it comes from the cow. So then you have 37 degrees. Then you take a heat pump with an efficiency of three that brings it to beyond 90 if you wanted to. So if you would have the cows around the factory, you could basically do everything in a closed cycle. Now you need a little bit of additional electricity, but it's not much. And this idea that you can simply close this energy cycle and you don't need a lot of energy anymore. Another example is there is this, this uh, old shipyard in, in Norway. What they did is they put, they, they put these, they connected the office towers, the high rises to a loop and the loop is connected to heat pumps. And then it's now brought down to the, uh, to the, foot, to the courtyard. And in the courtyard, they have a glycol cycle for cold energy and one for warm energy so they can heat the courtyard the waste heat the waste cooling from the heat pump is going to the glycol cycle for cooling and cooled and provides the cold to all the the small uh, store stars that provide food yeah for the cooling part and this is also connected to the district heating system and the guy that did it uh, he, he said to me yeah what we do is we take the office buildings as vertical uh, solar collectors because you need to to climatize them anyways and you have to put ventilation in there so all this energy that is coming in from the sun plus for the waste heat from the pcs plus the waste heat from us humans you know you're sitting there you're producing 120 watts uh, per hour as you just sit there as waste energy from you this can be brought back and this you know capturing it bring it back is super nice and then on top of it, he said, we didn't have to put the machines on the roof. So now we have a nice rooftop cafe. So, you know, it becomes a more holistic approach, a systematic approach. And every time I look at examples, it's much more fun. The number of examples is outstanding. We, mm -hmm. we have this heat pump city of the year award where we collect the best practice examples for buildings, for innovation and outstanding projects. And there is this, the, the other winner from last year was... Um, was a heat pump that is built into a ship. And the, there is a ship in the Netherlands that has, that has an office building basically, but it's floating and it has a heat pump in the basement or in the, in the lower decks. You can probably multiply that approach tremendously across the world. These type of things, or we have, we have this factory that has been built to the requirements of heat pumps. So they really looked at the process and said, Let's see, let's not just put the heat pump into an existing process. Let's see how we can design the process so it becomes more energy efficient and caters to the requirements of the heat pump technology more. And as the heat pump always provides heating and cooling, then they, they put the heat pump in the middle and said, okay, let's recuperate the cold when we need the heat and let's recuperate the heat when we need the cold and provide it to the respective area of the factory. And it becomes zero emission. The other day, somebody said, so what are you? And I think I'm really, to the matter of the word, a heat pump evangelist. I have been preaching about the advantages of this technology for such a long time. I probably would even do that if nobody paid me for that, because I'm fascinated by what is possible. Thermodynamics is great. If I would have to choose again, um, I would at least make a course in thermodynamics in, in uh, university. It certainly made me think, rethink my days at school and just how <laughs> disengaged I was from my physics and chemistry classes. I, I kind of, totally. I kind of... I wish that these topics had been there when I was at school. They would have got me so much more engaged and inspired. They're really interesting. But they were there. If you, if you imagine the origins of, of this refrigeration cycle, that is the basis for the heat pump. This is come from a guy named uh, Sadi Carnot in, in France in 1824. And of course, he had no computers, nothing. He had a pen and his brain to think this up, which is completely out of my imagination right and then it was 
precise by um, by Walter Thompson in, in in Scotland in Glasgow, I think in 1852 or 54, something like that. Mm. And then it was applied in mining uh, technology in Austria by this guy Ritter von Rittingen. And so you have a truly European project. And only because none of your teachers, and I would include mine, because I felt physics has nothing to do with my real life. And today I'm thinking, wow, that's so wrong. <laughs> so, but that, that yeah. could have been made much more interesting. Well, it's been so interesting talking to you today, Thomas. Thank you so much for all of your time and, and sharing all these really <laughs> fascinating projects and experiences with us. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see uh, what happens in Europe and, and in the coming months and years. And I hope that you'll come back uh, maybe next year and tell us uh, what other adventures you've been on and where else you've dri driven to in your in your electric car so yeah. thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure pleasure is all mine really and i think we are we have entered already the decade of heat pumps so it can only get better for this technology and Brilliant. i wish you good luck thank with your farm this, this is a very interesting project that you have there thank you so right much thanks thomas thanks thomas bye bye bye, -bye.